There's a lot of people in this room who are very, very knowledgeable on this topic, a lot of uh, speakers to follow who are very knowledgeable on this topic. I don't really consider myself an expert uh, in the room. Uh, I consider myself more of an advocate, more of somebody that has got some experience in uh, facilitating, really, the expertise that exists in, in our membership uh, and, and in the wider industry. Um, so, and a lot of you have probably sort of engaged in some of uh, our work, both at UK and World uh, GBC uh, before, and you've probably heard me speak before. So what I'm going to uh, try to do is just, I suppose, take stock uh, of the journey that we have uh, come on collectively, um, ask how far we've got and, and maybe how far we have got uh, to go, um, and I suppose sort of set the scene and, and throw out a few challenges uh, for us to deal with as we go uh, through the day. And I, I quite like to start days like this uh, with a, um, a, a, a supposition, I suppose, which is that there's probably nothing more important than our own health and well-being uh, or, or that of those that we love, which is quite a kind of sort of deep, uncomfortable thing to say for a Monday morning with a room full of uh, largely British people. But, um, <laughs> but, it, but that is true, isn't it? You know, ultimately, you know, this, is, this is pretty much the most important thing there is out there. Um, and... Uh, and, you know, we're starting to uh, value, I think, uh, our health and well-being in a, in a slightly different way. I'm not saying it's not always been important. Of course, it's always uh, been important. But we're beginning to understand that health, uh, not just physical uh, and even not just mental, but also uh, social health, if you look at a, a sort of World Health Organization uh, definition, has actually got a far greater bearing on happiness than income really importantly, once you've reached a certain standard of living, of course. Uh, but we're just beginning to understand, you know, really how uh, important it is. So, very timely, and hence uh, this phrase, which you might have seen me throw up on slides before, and I can't take any uh, great credit for it, but healthy is the new wealthy. And, and you'll be familiar with some of uh, these kind of headlines and some of these sort of trends, growth of Fitbits, you know, huge expansion of other uh, aspects of the consumer health market, um, healthy food, gym membership, and so on. And I think actually this has gone sort of well beyond a trend now. You know, this is you know very much a permanent kind of fixture. Those of us that have been working on this for a few years, we might have thought, you know, is this something that's going to come in, fade out a little bit over a few years? A absolutely not. You know, this kind of interest in this topic has gone from strength to strength. That last headline is interesting, Evening Standard last year. When estate agents start suggesting that uh, home buyers are asking them about air pollution uh, in particular, on particular roads in particular areas, you know something is happening you know, with the, the kind of national psyche. Of course, that's air pollution, that's external. It's going to impact what's going on internal. I'm sure we'll come on to some of that. Um, but, uh, but interesting nonetheless, and, and obviously related. To steal a phrase from my colleague, uh, Richard Francis, you know, we, we care more and more about what we put into our bodies, thinking about healthy food and so on, but we should also be caring about what we put our bodies into. So of course that brings us on to um, the conversation about healthy buildings. And this phrase, 90% rule, well, sort of mathematicians or scientists in the audience probably won't like the phrase rule. It's more of a coincidence. Uh, but we spend 90% of our lives indoors. We'll probably hear that phrase uh, quite a lot over the course of the day. Um, and coincidentally, 90% of employees say there's a direct link between their attitude to work and the quality of their workplace. That, that probably sounds quite obvious to us, but I'm not sure it's necessarily obvious to most employees that actually the physical space matters. And another 90%, and again, you've probably seen this stat before, 90% of a business's operating costs typically go on staff. So it's about the personal. We, kind of, we said that at the start. You know, health is, is obviously inherently very personal. But it's also about the professional. It's also about the profit. And that's a really kind of powerful combination, I think, you know, when, you, when you sort of put those concepts together. So no surprise. You know, that it's shot up the agenda for the property and construction industry over the past uh, two to three years. So just to take you a little bit on a sort of really rapid journey th through our own 
uh, work on this particular topic, started with some work in 2013 on the business case, a broad compendium of the business case for sustainability, and it was the chapter on health and well-being that really captured attention. This was at a global level. We then went on to do some work in offices, I'll obviously talk a bit more about that, looked at retail, we've done some work in homes, huge, you're not going to be able to see the detail, but a huge number of uh, countries interested in this. This is not a UK or a, or a European or even a North American phenomenon, of course. And in the spirit of practicing what we preach, we've also undergone a refurbishment of our offices in the building centre, so we've got some pretty live, uh, pretty recent experience of actually trying to implement health and wellbeing principles in our own uh, workplace as well, which is obviously pretty important that we do that. And this is our kind of approach. I'm not going to sort of go through this in a, in a huge amount of detail, but you know, we've come to understand more about the impact that the physical uh, workplace environment has on staff health and well-being, and that very often there are these synergies between design for human health and design for a positive you know, environmental impact as well. And I'm not going to talk about this in a huge amount of detail. Most of you know this, but you know, talking about the use of daylight that, of course, can uh, improve energy use, but also is hugely important for circadian rhythms. Thinking about natural, uh, breathable material, reducing VOCs, improving air quality. Uh, not just inside the building, but thinking about outside the building, perhaps greening the public realm, being better for biodiversity, encouraging cycling, encouraging walking, uh, walking reducing emissions from public transport, um, visible stairs, encouraging not just uh, uh, use of your legs and physical exercise, but also social interaction and reducing energy in lifts. So there's a huge number of things where there is this kind of positive win-win. Uh, and we've also spent a lot of time trying to sort of help people make uh, the business case, which is, again, you know, I think probably a quite important theme for today. And we've come to realize that actually that has to be really quite specific and, and in a way quite bespoke for people. You know, they have to understand, we have to all understand, how does my building impact my staff? What is my own uh, business case? And that uh, brought us on to uh, this kind of framework, and uh, we're using framework in the, in the sort of loosest sense of, of the term. This is, you know, very, very flexible uh, that can be used with any number of different tools and other sort of systems. But this is something we created in 2014 for offices. We then moved on to retail and tweaked it a bit, and we've gone on tweaking the language and tweaking some of the terms as, as, as we've gone on. And it's really to understand the interplay between space, people's perception of it, and the impact that that space can have in terms of better health, well-being, and productivity for the organization uh, as a whole. And because we like alliteration, we've gone for environmental, so that's the physical characteristic of the space, and you can probably think just about see some of the obvious sort of features that you'd expect there. Experiential being you know, the perception of that space and, and measuring that through a, through a survey. And economic, that being those kind of organizational outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, typically, they've got a sort of financial uh, aspect to them. And as you say, as you can see, we're sort of suggesting that the impact flows that way. Of course, there's going to be lots of things that are impacting those economic factors, but what we want to know is to what extent are they these factors. And this has been a really helpful kind of framework that we've used with our members and with others, uh, and that there are more and more case studies now uh, developing around that again here you know, help provide this practical information for people and provide just a bit of a kind of um, a bit of a guide really to understanding this crucial point how does my building impact my staff and we've been coming to an end of a process one or two of you are involved called um, we've called it our well-being lab so we've had a sort of six to seven month process where we've had about 11 teams of occupiers, some of them working with their landlord, some of their workplace advisors, where they've been applying elements of this uh, framework to their own uh, spaces. And we'll be sharing the sort of full results from that process in two or three uh, weeks' time. Um, but it's been timely, you know, for, for, for us to, to take this bit of a stock take as to, you know, where we're at uh, as an industry. And I'm just going to share a few of the kind of lessons learned along the way, pulling out a few little sneak previews from the well being lab, but also uh, just from the, from the body of work that, that we've undergone uh, over the last few years. So a couple of slides here. Firstly, this point I sort of started out with really, 
health you know really is personal you know it actually feels a lot more directly relevant for people than this kind of concept of slightly vague concept of sustainability uh, but it can be a really good route in to having those wider uh, conversations sounds pretty obvious but that has definitely come through really really strongly secondly that that point i made about staff perception perception of that space can't really overstate how uh, important that is to understand uh, you know, the, the, the building. And actually, the environmental piece, although it was to the left-hand side, in a way might, be a, might come second, because you can use that to then validate you know, the messages that you're getting back uh, from uh, people. And to a certain extent, it's actually a lot, to a certain extent, easier and certainly cheaper to actually do, just to, to ask people you know, about their perception of the space. Thirdly, there are some kind of quick, you know, reasonably low-cost wins, uh, which this is not, you know, going to sound like rocket science, but it's worth kind of, you know, flagging up, particularly in the spirit of sort of practical advice. Um, this kind of analysis, getting to grips with uh, the, the space, can help flush out where things are just simply not working. You know, the number of times that, that bits of kit are coming on at the wrong time or, you know, are not performing optimally. So, you know, we can get a bit of better information uh, from that. Uh, things like putting more plants in a space, pl putting more artwork in a space, these are kind of fairly kind of low-cost interventions that can really help. Providing f uh, fruit, reducing clutter, I mean, this kind of sounds really obvious, but this can actually all really add up to something that, you know, is much more um, pleasant to work in. Uh, switching a cleaning regime to more eco-friendly products can actually have quite, quite a big uh, impact. Zoning space to allow for you know, different types of work, collaboration here, sort of quiet work there. Again, probably reasonably uh, self-explanatory for, kind of for this kind of audience. Of course, more significant interventions are, uh, are harder and they, and they cost money. And you know, we've got uh, live, as I said, experience of that you know, in our own refurb uh, in the building center. You know, we could have put in filters to our new ventilation system. We didn't uh, for largely for kind of cost uh, reasons. We had to sort of take a, take a choice there. So, you know, we're bringing in air to improve the uh, stuffiness of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the office, but that's unfiltered air. So, is there a, so there's a bit of a trade-off, you know, there. Um, our sort of choice of products was impacted here, and there was a premium to some of the healthy products that we went with, for example, the carpets, but that was a choice that we, you know, we wanted to make. Um, we were lucky because with the Green Building Council and members wanted to chip in, so we were able to do you know, quite a lot of that sort of, in a way other people wouldn't have been able to do. And if we were paying full whack for some of those products, then would we have made different choices? Well, yeah, we probably would have. We'd have had to you know, prioritize. What would we prioritize here? We'd have probably prioritized fresh air, then lighting, then we might move on to some of the other, what might be slightly more kind of uh, visual things like the green wall that, that, that we put in. So, you know, really, really kind of serious choices that, that we're having to make. We're also learning that monitoring can be really, really difficult. So this piece around environment, you know, we've been through this process with the teams on our wellbeing lab, and, you know, quite consistent feedback. Uh, coming back that, that monitoring is sort of frankly harder than it should be. And these are with, you know, tech savvy folk who are working within the in industry. They're there as occupiers, but they're there because they want to practice what they preach. And they're finding that really, really difficult. And I think that's partly um, because the monitors are still, this is still reasonably new. Um, it's partly that you know, they're trying to get them to fit in with existing systems. They need access to the Wi-Fi. There's then security issues. So you get all of these kind of little things or big things you know, that, that, that people can, can trip, a, trip up a little bit on. But the, you know, the market still feels quite young. It obviously needs to, be, to mature, but let's be, let's be honest about that. And engaging the right people is, is really tough. That's definitely what we've uh, found, especially actually in large organizations. So particularly thinking of colleagues in HR, particularly senior colleagues in HR, where you might want to get hold of that great data on something like absenteeism, particularly sort of breaking that down by floor or a particular area, really, really, really tricky. Could be FM, could be finance directors. But what we have found is that where people do get that collaboration and do get that buy-in, 
it's you know it's really worthwhile you know they they get senior champions on board it really helps them uh, make the business case internally but it's quite challenging and so i suppose what all of that adds up to is you know we're still at the start of this journey relatively speaking even though we've been working on this for three or four years it's been out there for a while um, you know as an industry we've got a long way to go particularly when we start thinking about the extended industry of kind of you know occupiers more widely uh, i think we have a really uh, quite long way to go so final slide just want to sort of throw out a few challenges uh, for us i'm kind of fortunate i get to stand up throw out a few challenges <laughs> then go and sit down but i will be back on the panel in a bit um but this is not just this is not for you this is for us you know this is for all of us um I think if you're an advocate for health and well-being, you know, do what you can you know, in your own building um, and, and then share, share your experiences. Um, remarkable, I think, how many, just being slightly critical, self-critical uh, of us collectively, how many of us are kind of strong champions for this. But, oh, but I, I can't, there's reasons I can't do it in my own building for, for, you know, for this, this, and this. And, and I think that's, you know, that's not good enough. We need, to, you know, we need to take steps, even if those steps are quite small uh, to start with. So you know, we've just got our monitoring set up, having moved back in after our refurbishment, and we're going to be you know, as transparent as we possibly can be you know, about that. Um, which comes on to another point, you know, be transparent, because it's going to happen anyway. What I mean by that is this whole process of people uh, being much more open you know, with their information, with their data, fixing up their smartphones and so on. People have heard me say before, I can open an app on my phone right now. I can find out what the air quality is in my own living room. This is a trend that is not going uh, to stop. So we've got platforms like the Reset platform, uh, you know, where people put monitors in their building and then share their real-time data with the world. You know, this is a trend that's going to continue. So let's get out ahead of that and not wait for it to sort of happen to us. I've already said the monitoring point, but there's a massive opportunity, I think, technologically and in terms of the services that we're providing as an industry. And the last one, which is a little bit incendiary, maybe, in the, in the kind of with, with, with friends in the room. But um, you know, do we have the right tools? We may do, and you know, maybe that's perhaps something we could discuss a bit later. You know, I'm particularly thinking about the existing stock here. You know, I'm a really big supporter of Bream. I'm a big supporter of Well. You know, in their current guises, are they going to be taken up right across the board? Is this going to go really sort of mainstream? You know, we've got workplace kite marks. We've got online systems like Glassdoor, but that's not about the quality of the space. You know, have we got what we need to really make this? simple so that people can very easily understand you know, how uh, my building is impacting me, how healthy is uh, my workplace, what can be taken up across you know, organizations you know, right across uh, the country. A challenge, I'd be interested in you know, people's response to that. Um, that's me. Paul, was I on time? You were indeed. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.